Good morning and welcome. Oh, there we go. We briefly lost connection, but I think we're good to go again. I'm so glad you're worshiping with us this morning. It is about three minutes till 10 as I say this. So we're gonna get started here in just a few minutes. Um, it is a beautiful, cool, almost autumn-like morning here in Sagatuck, and I am gl so glad that you are joining us. So just a few minutes and we'll get going. We should bring the hula hoops back. We are. We should bring the hula hoops back. The what back? The hula hoops. Hula hoops. For your dive through. No, no. It looks like almost a week off.
all the time? Yes, God is very good. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you all so much for joining us this week on WFCC 89.7 FM. Your home for loving God, loving each other, and serving our community here on the almost autumn coast of Lake Michigan. I am Pastor Sarah Jalau, broadcasting, of course, from the sidewalk out in front of the church. And joining us for this week's worship broadcast is, perhaps you guessed it, Bob Ruddy on, on the organ who pre-recorded some lovely music for us to sing along with today. And our scripture reader for this morning is Kathy Brockington, who will be reading a passage from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, the Take Up Your Cross and Follow Me invitation, which is quite the thought for us to think about this morning. And for all of you students hanging out with us in the parking lot, soon you will be invited to head over to the activity tent on the front lawn where you can build your very own rain stick. <laughs> all of that is in about eight minutes after a little bit of all family prayer and praise. Remember that our on-site crossing guard, Miss Cindy Rao, she is on road patrol helping our kids of all ages be safe as they cross the road that happens to run through our grand open sanctuary here at the church. Now I do have a couple of announcements before we get to the good stuff. First, I ordered a couple weeks ago one of the uh, singer's masks from the Broadway Relief Project and it came this week. And so if you wanted to look at it uh, for a pattern idea, or if you wanted to consider getting one for yourself because you're a singer, you just want to check it out. I have it with me here today, and I also have all of the instructions on how to get a good fit and how to take care of these kinds of masks. So a singer's mask is here for you all to look at. Next up, you will note in your bulletin, and it's been in our midweek news for a couple of weeks now, uh, we are going to start looking for a new Sunday school director. So if you know someone who loves the Bible and loves kids and wants to foster a wonderful environment here at the church for our young families, we are starting that hunt now. So let them know that we are looking for them. Also on Wednesday evenings here at the church, we have our campfire fellowship gatherings around seven o'clock. We start up the fire. We've got some more makings here and we'll sing some songs and we'll just have an opportunity to be in each other's presence and have some good fellowship opportunity. I wanted to mention one more time, Groove is back for all of you dancers in the congregation. 10 a.m. on Friday mornings, we are meeting over at the parking lot at Encompass Wellness. We've kind of combined the 8 a.m. class and the 10 a.m. class for one big dance party on Friday morning. So we hope to see you at Groove. And then finally, if you would like to contribute to the ministry of the church, you are welcome to mail a check to the church or you'll see on the last page of your bulletin, if you would like to give online, you can text 833-705-1016, text GIVE to that number, and you'll receive back a link to our Tithely account so that you can give online. Again, that number is 833-705-1016. That's in your bulletin on your last page. And if you're joining us online, that is in the description of the worship service. All right, I think that's all I have for announcements before our service today. So let's go ahead and just take a moment to take a deep breath and uh, then we'll sing our way into service again.
please join me in our call to worship. We are gathered together on holy ground. We gather as a community of compassion and hope. Jesus calls us to care for each other tenderly and willingly. By our worship and our care, we are known as followers of Jesus. By our example and our joy-filled coming together, may others be led to lives of peace. Lord, open our hearts and bring us along in our discipleship. Teach us to serve you truer and more fully every day. Lord, hear our worship today. Our opening hymn is This Is Our Church. Good to hear Bob and all of his flourish with the organ. Will you join me in prayer, please? Lord of summer sunshine and autumn harvest, be with us this day as we gather to encounter your word and your way for us. Guide our steps, we pray, and pick us up when we falter, dust us off, and place us on the pathways of grace and service. And Lord, hear us as we continue to have our hearts and voices united in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, kids, if you would like to head over to the front lawn for making rain sticks, you are welcome to do so. I'm going to pass my, that's just fun, my rain stick on to Kristen as she uh, leads the way over. Cindy is ready to help you cross the street. In congregation, as the kids head over for their activity, let's bless them with singing a round of Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes. And now making her way up is Kathy Brockington to read from the Gospel of Matthew. Good morning, everyone. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world, but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Word of God. Thank you, Kathy. Before we get into our sermon, let's just have a quick mic check. Is the volume okay for everybody? Up, I'm seeing. Is that a little better? Volume for, okay. I don't know if that's up or a thumbs up, so I'm, I'm guessing that's good. Okay. So I've preached this text easily half a dozen times in my preaching career. I've encountered it in devotional studies. I've heard it preached to me in sermons. I've taught it at camp easily a hundred times over, maybe. It's one of those passages in scripture that has a gravity to it. It's cross-stitchable, it's artistic, it's catchy. It's plastered on a bunch of stuff over at Hobby Lobby, of course. We come across it a lot. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus says. There is something grandiose about that invitation. There is something wonderful about it. It is big and it is intimidating and it is scary and it is soaring all at the same time. But I've always felt that it doesn't come across well in preaching. Maybe because it feels a little unattainable or because it feels like to preach it 
offers people this sort of self-sacrifice, holier-than-thou martyr complex, like a showy kind of piety that misses the point. We end up uplifting struggle and hardship for the sake of struggle and hardship. There is a tendency to religiousize suffering when we walk away from this text. It can be a little messy. But this week it all sort of snapped into place for me a bit. This passage I think needed a pandemic context for me to fall in love with it again. So let's take a moment and uh, before I visit that point, I want us to, to step into the scene. In Mark's version of this story, this moment acts as a very clear hinge in the gospel. In Matthew, the hinge comes with what's next, the transfiguration, but we're also, we're just very close. We're in that hinge moment. This is just about the time at which all of the actions of the gospel pivot and turn. From now on, everything in the story points towards Jerusalem, towards Jesus suffering and his death. From now on, the path that Jesus walks is straight to the cross. Up until now, Jesus has been preaching the good news, the reign of God is at hand, and the power and truth of this preaching has been confirmed with miracles and healings and exorcisms. Jesus has been busy speaking and doing, and all of the speaking and doing is infused with the unmistakable and awesome power of God. The public reaction to all of this has been swift and unsettling, shall we say. Everywhere Jesus goes, and in almost everything he does, Jesus attracts attention. He also attracts criticism from the powers that be. The authorities, mighty and lowly, are all kind of scandalized by him. He forgives sins, showing that people can be free of the system of offering sacrifices at the temple. He heals on the Sabbath, teaching that God made the seventh day for rest and wholeness and connection rather than legalism. He heals people considered untouchable, uprooting ideas of who's in and who's out. And so it makes sense, thinking about it as a whole, that Jesus keeps urging people he encounters, including his disciples, to keep who he is a secret. Today's hinge story tells us pretty clearly why. Jesus is a wanted man. All his turning upside down of power and authority all of his bending and breaking rules about who's welcome at the table of the kingdom of God, all of this has created a climate where Jesus' life is at jeopardy. Last week we heard Jesus ask his disciples, who do people say that I am? John the Baptist, Elijah, some say the prophets, they shouted. And Jesus pressed the question further, remember? Now who do you say that I am? And bless him, it was Peter that answered. The Christ, the Messiah, the final answer. And he gets it right. The old fisherman from Capernaum, the bumbler, the king of misunderstandings, the rock, he gets it right. Nicely done, Peter. Once Peter nails his answer, Jesus takes this moment to teach and to push and to deliver another hard truth. Jesus said that the Son of Man will suffer, that he will be rejected by the people and the authorities, and that one day soon he would be killed and in three days raise to life again. It's almost like Jesus is, yes, they finally get who I am. Now I'm going to bring them in on the whole plan. It's a lot. It's like drinking from the fire hose for the disciples. And it pushes Peter, the rock, over the edge, and in classic rock fashion, he plummets fast. Peter scolds Jesus for his macabre prediction. Because naturally, nobody hears anything after, soon I will be killed. 
And Jesus, in what is probably the sharpest rebuke in all of Scripture, he puts Peter immediately in his place. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on, not on divine things, but on human things. And Jesus turns to the room and he gets back to business. He turns very serious and he says, if any of you want to become my follower, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, they will save it. And there it is, our magic verse of the day. As Jesus' words ring in Peter's ear and in our ears, it reminds us that how messy and hijackable this passage can be. How do we process and communicate how it seems a holy life isn't about living at all, but about dying? We risk minimizing this or maximizing this passage. We minimize it when we say, okay, I will temper myself on Facebook, I'll step away from Instagram for a few days, I'll pray more, I'll study more, I'll tithe more, I'll volunteer more. I'll attend worship every Sunday until this pandemic ends, even though I'm sick of sitting in my car or tuning in online. These are all good things and they have their moment, but not, I think, what Jesus meant when he invited the crowd to lose their life for the sake of the gospel. And on the other hand, we maximize these words to become, as the old expression goes, so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. This is the kind of radical self-denial that strips life of all pleasure or delight or celebration or joy. The single mindedness that reduces the world to a grim mission field, a landscape to conquer with our brutal bullish zeal. It's a behavior that recognizes ideology before humanity. It's been the kind of sacrifice that has encouraged people to stay in abusive relationships or spiral in their own victimhood. It mistakes austerity for piety. And I don't think that's what Jesus meant by taking up the cross. We minimize it or we maximize it. And these are messy dichotomies that make this passage, one, hard to preach and hard to receive. But right here and right now, these words feel different than they ever have before. Right now, we are worshiping alongside the sidewalk in the parking lot because there is a pandemic, which is hard. This week, Jacob Blake was shot in the back seven times by an officer in Kenosha, now paralyzed, and that is hard. This week, there was a hurricane that battered the Gulf Coast. Again, that's hard. There are all these advancing hard things, wildfires and white supremacy and racial injustice and unemployment and economic inequality and a rather theatrical election. And, 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 we are amidst a swirl of hard things. And for once, it does not feel like a stretch to say that we are sitting in a whole field of crosses. To take up a cross, as Jesus did, is to stand in the center of the world's pain. Not just to glance in the general direction of suffering and then scurry away, but to dwell there. To identify ourselves with those who are aching and weeping and screaming and dying. To insist that our comfort isn't worth it unless the least and the lost can share in it too. Debbie Thomas wrote this week that Taking up the cross means recognizing Christ crucified in every suffering soul and body that surrounds us and pouring our energies and our lives into alleviating that pain, no matter what it costs. 
It means accepting against all the lies of our culture that we will die. It means following up that courageous acceptance with the most important question that I can ask. Given our inevitable death, how shall I spend this brief, singular, God-breathed life? So I wonder, how are we going to spend that brief, singular, God-breathed life? Are we going to cling to it, hoard it in fear? Are we going to give it away in hope? Are we going to do everything that we can to protect ourselves, even if it leads to numbness and apathy? Or are we going to express life abundant with Jesus? Will we live for ourselves? Or will we stand and dwell with those who ache and weep and bleed and need? Peter, he pushed suffering away, and Jesus rebuked him for it. And still, we are invited to follow down a hard path. We are invited to follow Christ down a road that leads to eternal life. What Peter missed was that Jesus was up to something. That Jesus had a plan in mind that he could never have predicted. Jesus said he was going to be raised from the dead. Jesus said he was going to change the world. Jesus said that he would topple the walls of the temple and rebuild. And yet Peter stopped listening the second Jesus said the road was going to be hard and not what he wanted it to be. This is what stopped me in my tracks this week. What if we acknowledged that Jesus was up to something again? What if we created a little room in our pandemic fuzzy brains to see that there are changes afoot? What if we lost, let die, all that was normal and familiar in this world and recognized that there is nowhere to go but forward from this place? Would we let die all that was comfortable and open ourselves to taking up a heavy cross so that we can trudge forward to a new and holy creation? What would we lose in that? The list is long, I think. What would we gain? The list is long, too. If we want the earth to recover from hurricanes and wildfires and melting polar ice caps, we might need to let go of our dependence on fossil fuels, which means changing the way we travel, which means changing the way we consume. If we want systems of racism to die, we need to do the work of looking at our own prejudices in the eye. It means growing the community of people that we are exposed to. It means creating room at the table for new voices and perspectives so that we don't pass prejudices down to the next generation. If we want this pandemic to end, we need to set aside our own interests and, dare I say, sometimes our own liberties so that we can prioritize what Jesus called his greatest commandment to love God and love our neighbors as ourself. If we want our community to recover and thrive, our churches, our schools, our restaurants and businesses, then we need to create some space for ingenuity and doing things differently. Children of God, what do we have to lose by taking up our crosses and following our Lord into a new and holy creation. We could lose a lot of normal. What do we stand to gain? Everything. I'm gonna repeat that Debbie Thomas quote from earlier. Taking up the cross means recognizing Christ crucified in every suffering soul and body that surrounds us and pouring our energies and our lives into alleviating their pain, no matter what it costs. 
It means accepting against all the lies of my culture that I will die. It means following up that courageous acceptance with the most important question I could ask. Given my inevitable death, how shall I spend this brief, singular, God-breathed life? That is a good question for us to carry with us into this week. May we all encounter this invitation to take up our cross and follow Christ in a new and fascinating way from this point forward. Amen. All right, let's prepare ourselves to sing again. Our hymn of response this morning is, How Shall I Serve You, O Lord? Before we go into our congregational prayer, I have some good news to share with you all. Last week, I let you know that Brad Rudick was finally going in for his heart surgery. And I'm happy to say that all went as planned and he's doing really well. He's over at the hospital at U of M and will likely stay there for a while. Uh, Jana told me that if you would like to send cards of encouragement, just send those to the house and uh, he would love to have those in the months of recovery that are ahead for him. But good news for, for Brad's sake. It all went well. All right, let's, uh, let's be in prayer together. Lord of hope, we come to you this day. We have followed many paths, and the one of hope leads to this doorway, to this family, God, enter our hearts this day as we share our joys and concerns in prayer and in the actions and service that follow. We lift before you situations and people who are in need of your healing mercies and your peace. Help us to be those who bring this peace to them. Let us be in prayer, lifting our concerns to God. God, we pray for Brad and his healing from heart surgery. God, be with Jana and his family, his community that surrounds him, that they might best know how to take care of him and themselves during this, this time. God, walk with them all through this journey of healing. 
God, we pray for a young woman named Emily who is processing a trauma. God, bring peace to her mind, her soul. God, we pray for this whole COVID-19 pandemic. We pray that this would come to an end. We pray for all of the medical workers and caregivers that serve our vulnerable population. We pray for people who have to go to work in risky places every morning. We pray for our students and teachers that as they gather at the beginning of the school year that they might be protected from the sickness. God, breathe healing and mercy into this world. As our lives have encountered difficulties and concerns, so too are we blessed with great joys. We celebrate these moments of happiness and wonder with each other. Let's lift up our joys to God. Lord, we thank you for birthdays and anniversaries and weddings. We thank you for those, those marks and milestones at life. God, we thank you for a community for blessed togetherness. God, we thank you for this day and the turning of the seasons. God, we just thank you for the joy and love and happiness that you have pressed into our lives, into our hearts. Lord, bless all of those that we have named before you in our hearts, with our voices. Touch each of them, all of their lives, with blessings and peace and mercy. Give us all strength and empower us for your ministries of reconciliation in this world. In your name we pray this morning. Amen. If you'd like, you can join me in our sending blessing. Christ asks if we love him. If we say yes, he says, then take care of one another. This is our opportunity to make a difference, to live lovingly on the frontiers of this bright new world. We cannot promise to do it perfectly, but we can give it a go relying on his abundant wisdom to take our small love and fit it into a larger pattern of good for all creation. May God bless the world in which you move and bless your home and bless our friends. May God bless the eyes with which you see and bless the ears with which you hear. May God bless the way you use your hands Bless the way you employ your presence as a bonus from the living God in Christ Jesus. Grace, mercy, and peace will be yours today and always. Amen. Our closing hymn is Be Exalted, O God. Let's sing together.
one was a new one for us. <laughs> uh, let's join our voices in reading our church covenant. We covenant with the Lord and one with another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in all his ways according as he is pleased to reveal himself unto us in his blessed word of truth. Go now and be the church for your work, your witness, your welcome is just beginning here and now. Amen and amen. Go in peace. Feels good to end on a strong musical note. <laughs> Thanks for joining for worship, everybody. God bless you. Have a wonderful week and uh, stay good to one another. Bye.